Hello there, I'm Gloria Makarenko. While well, the city's magic and colorful character is on full display this week, this is Our Vancouver. Coming up, we go undersea to check out a prehistoric glass reef. And Vancouver's own Rod Chow shows us the magic that put him at the top of a magical society. But first, we'll meet the young Burnaby girl who plays the main character in a new Netflix series for kids. A new Mattel and Netflix children's series features a young Burnaby girl as the main character. Yeah, the cartoon centers on a South Asian girl and her family. They're living and working in their hotel, and it's called Deepa and Anoop. And it is really too cute to miss. And we are so happy today that Pavan Baraj and her mom, Sabrina Baraj, are here with us to tell us all about it. Hello there, and welcome to both of you. Hello. Thanks for having us. Pavan, tell me about your character, Deepa, in this, in this series. Deepa is a seven-year-old girl who lives with her multi-generational South Asian family and her best friend, Anoop, who is a color-changing elephant. Okay, how did you even get involved in this in the first place? Well, uh, there was an open casting call on a Facebook Mommy's page, which my mom saw and asked if I would like to try out. And I was like, yeah, sure, why not? But I never thought that I would get the part. Okay, so what did you have to do for the audition? Well, they sent over some sides, and I just basically had to read them out, and I also had to sing a song of my choice. <laughs> okay. All right, Serena, from the mom's perspective, you, you're on this Facebook page, and you're saying, wait a second, this might be something for my daughter? How did it unfold from your perspective? Well, my kids had always been the creative types. They'd come to the living room and sit us down and make us watch their cute little shows that they'd put on for us, and so I knew they always had that sort of bug in them. Mm -hmm. And so when I came across this notice, so I was like, you know, she kind of fits the bill. She's the right age, she's South Asian, and, you know, she's shy, so I think voiceover work might be a good creative outlet for her. So I sent the email in, we got the script, and I kind of coached her through it, and, and it was COVID time, so of course it was um, a self-tape. We recorded it, we sent it in, and we thought, okay, you know, we're never going to hear back. Of course, there's thousands of people auditioning, and the very next day we got a phone call. <laughs> <laughs> and we were just jumping up and down. We couldn't believe it. Oh, that, so what happened next? And what, what was that whole process of voicing the character? Like, did you, did you have the images to follow, or did they do the voice first and then, and then put the animation? So, because it was during COVID, it was recorded where I was the only actor in the studio, and there was nobody else, and the director and the musical director and everyone else was on a Zoom screen. So it was a really interesting experience, and they recorded all the audio before doing the animation, so I didn't really get to see anything. Oh, I see. So how does it feel now that you get to see it? It's so exciting, and it's so cool to see my voice up on the TV. <laughs> I know. Oh, wait a second, but a couple of years have passed already, right? Yeah. The actual work was done a few years ago when right. she was just 10. Yeah, we started um, in the summer of 2022, and um, of course, again, it was COVID, so they were going into an online school year, which was also new for everybody. Um, but it kind of worked out in our favor because she was able to just chat with her teachers, let them know she wouldn't be attending by Zoom that day, and she was able to get her work done before before and after on the days that we went in to record. So uh, it, was, it was a total adventure. Pavan, what's it been like for you to have to keep this a secret from everybody <laughs> until the release of the series? It was so exciting and I just couldn't wait until it came out and I could show everybody and tell all my friends and my family. Finally, finally. Let's talk about the subject matter here, Sabrina. What was it like for you as part of the South Asian community to see that representation on screen. It really, it really hit me in the heart. You know, when I was growing up, I never felt like I saw myself represented or my family represented on TV. And I always kind of felt a little bit of an outsider to mainstream culture. And so when I saw this and when I read the scripts, it really got me, it, I felt so 
proud and so valued and so heard and so understood and I felt like it was an amazing thing to be able to give that to my kids right I have a younger daughter who's in that age range she's six and she just watches it now and she's like mommy look they're just like us they have grandparents that live with them they you know eat the same food they like samosas they celebrate the Wally so it really it, it's very important I think do you feel that way as well Fallon yes I completely feel that way and it's so nice to see my little sister like pointing at the TV mm -hmm. and being like, oh, Deepa can be a doctor, I can be a doctor too. <laughs> I love it. Now, what about the stage mom aspect of this, Sabrina? Are you saying, okay, let's get you on to some other movies and some other projects and this type of thing? I'm kind of just letting the kids, um, you know, be in charge. Like my son got really interested and said, hey, I want to try it too. So, um, you know, we got an agent and he's done some voice work now. He's also done some television work. Um, then the littlest one was like, I want to try it too. So she's on board so we're just kind of letting them take the projects as they come and and if they're interested in it and you know I just said I'm hands off I'll hear I'm here to support you and if you decide you don't want to do it anymore then then we're not gonna do it anymore oh I love that so Pavan what about for you now I mean you you did this two years ago you've been doing some auditions what where do you hope this this can take you well I really hope that I can continue doing this and do more voice work or on-screen work and see what happens. I think there's going to be some good things happening. Do you get that feeling, Sabrina? I do. I have the tingles. <laughs> Thank you very much for sharing this and all the best to both of you. Thank you so Thank much. You. I'm Melanie. And I'm Daniela. And, and you're watching our Vancouver. There is a hidden treasure that lies at the bottom of Howe Sound glass sponge reefs, believed to be thousands of years old. But there is concern that those rare reefs are vanishing. The pinnacle where we're gonna drop the divers today is at about 80 feet, 82 feet. With each trip, trepidation for Glenn Dennison. Below these waters, unknown to most, are living dinosaurs. According to scientists, they are glass sponge reefs, unique in the world and disappearing. Beautiful, right over the sponge right now. Despite Denison's desperate decades-long fight to save them. I discovered them, so you know, right away they're my children. <laughs> I want to wait until they're ready. They're ready, Glenn. Go! While writing a book on diving, he came across these reefs. As fragile as the most delicate crystal made of silica, the main component of glass, a holdover from the Jurassic period thought to have been extinct for 40 million years. These are believed to be 9,000 years old. This could be life from another planet or it could be the early start of life on planet Earth. BC is believed to be the only place on Earth that sponges grow into massive reefs, likely thanks to the region's unique geography and ancient glaciers that provide the abundant supply of the silica they need to flourish. Of late, though, most dives bring up bad news. You know, to see how the reefs looked even 10 years ago to now, it's, it is really sad to see the, the damage that we're, that we're witnessing when we go down there. This is 2016, and this is now. Last fall, diver Tori Preddy was devastated to see part of a glass sponge reef shattered by prawn traps. I honestly thought we'd been dropped at the wrong place. There's like, what, what is this? Where is the reef? Like, what's going on? And what we're going to do is drop the uh, deep drop camera. Denison has almost single-handedly funded regular dives to help map every inch of the rare reefs. An engineer, he developed a camera that can drop hundreds of feet to document their current health. The reef is a living entity that cleans billions of liters of water every day. They filter the water roughly every 90 days, the entire sound. That's all the water in the sound. So they're bacteria feeders, uh, they're habitat for the rockfish here. So, so it's an ecosystem that's incredibly beautiful, but it's also incredibly useful. Denison's work helped push the Department of Fisheries and Oceans to start banning bottom contact fishing in the reef so far discovered in Howe Sound seven years ago. Several others found further up the coast have also been protected. The DFO enforcement officers are doing the best job they possibly can out there, but they are so short-staffed that they just cannot protect the sound properly. Yeah, so here we have a couple of pieces of uh, reef that have come up 
Fisheries officers say they do patrol regularly and that infractions dropped significantly after the first protections were announced, but increased dramatically after the pandemic, prompting new steeper fines. These new tickets are hundreds of dollars more than the tickets that we had to utilize uh, only a year ago. They say it's up to boaters and fishers, whether brand new or experienced, to know the maps and the rules. We cannot enforce on destruction. That means that you can't wait till someone drops a trap down there and hope that you're going to give them a ticket or take away their gear. Add to that another threat to their survival, climate change. The warming waters killing the sponge. That was a dive. At least today, they didn't find any new destruction. There's still lots of good sponges there, but we definitely saw some of the damaged sponges as well. It looked pretty similar to the last time I was here. If it's damaged or destroyed, it may not come back. We don't have the science yet to prove that these things are going to regenerate again. They, they may actually disappear off the planet. And it's that specter of extinction that keeps Denison fighting to save these wondrous sea creatures hidden beneath these waters. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, House Sound, BC. An isolated canal, not far from the BC town of Atlin, is where you will find the Eldrick Rock Lighthouse. It's been abandoned for most of the century, but it is also the oldest lighthouse in the state of Alaska. And it's the reason a group of dedicated volunteers is visiting the lonely outpost. Let's watch. Emerging from the clouds, the island of Eldred Rock appears from afar. It's a monument that captivates all those who see it. For the last half century, the lighthouse has stood empty. But this summer, the island welcomed people again. Ten people, volunteers from across Alaska's southeast, braved the rocky waters to spend a week inside its walls. They're part of a team vying to bring the lighthouse back to life. Our goal is to have um, all the living spaces, the kitchen, bathroom, cleared and cleaned and tested by next year to open to the public. The lighthouse was built in the wake of a tragedy. Dozens of lives lost at sea in a winter storm. Here to the north of the island was uh, where the steamship Claire Nevada wrecked in 1898. It was full of um, Yukon gold from the gold rush, but unfortunately they had explosives aboard and hit a rock right at the tip of this and exploded. There was flames seen from the mainland. So the, coast, uh, the uh, Congress at that time dedicated funding from the, the United States to build five lighthouses in this area, Eldridge Rock being the last one of them built. Preservation agencies around the state have recognized that this is worth the time, the funds, and the effort to save. To the volunteers working here, the lighthouse is a hidden gem that shows off the best of Alaska's southeastern coast. I like it the way it is, so let's, let's keep it that way. And if we can restore this place to something to be proud of, I think that's worthwhile and worth my time. It hurts my feelings, that's why. We think over time it can be self-sustaining as we make it open to the public and have them realize the value of it, contribute, either have functions here or weddings, type of thing. Technology will replace the need for lighthouses. But doesn't, what the technology doesn't do is keep the history intact. It is time for one of our favorite features where we get to showcase a number of the photographs that are sent in by you. Well, let's start with this one. Vikram Rijal sent in this lovely splash of summer color taken in Burnaby. Such a beautiful palette. Thank you. Richard Topping was flying high when he captured this shot of our coastal mountain range. Just beautiful, thanks very much. And finally, Roy Green was in Rat Trevor Provincial Park near Parksville when he came across this scene. He calls it Deer Chilling Park. Just lovely, thank you very much. Well, if you're out and about over the summer with your camera, with your phone, send us in some of your favorite images. It's easy, send them to bcphotos at cbc.ca bcphotos at cbc.ca and coming up science smart with johanna wagstaff is going to explore why extreme temperatures and intensifying drought conditions go hand in hand Turn, turn, turn. 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 
unstackable dog. Look, around, around, go, 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 go. Oh, this guy, I think, takes the win. High five. Western Europe, the UK, much of Western US and parts of Canada all under drought watch right now as hot and dry conditions continue through the second half of the summer. It seems obvious that high temperatures lead to extended drought conditions, but it's not as straightforward. First of all, that's because our high temperatures often come with a high pressure system. That means sinking air as that high uh, basically cooks air at ground levels in what we've come to know on the West Coast as a heat dome. But that sinking air also means it limits the formation of clouds, which is why so often high temperatures means little rainfall. The second factor to high temperatures bumping up drought conditions is the fact that higher temperatures means more evaporation. So in a warming climate, we will see more evaporation of the moisture in soils, and that means a quicker drying out of the ground below. Finally, when we do get rain, that often can lead to flash flooding. Take a look at this mini experiment from the University of Reading where you can see this, the moisture content of grasses really leads to the absorption of water in different ways. A dry baked ground often becomes compacted as the moisture is taken from it. So it almost acts as a barrier to incoming rainfall. Uh, this, the sand particles almost become hydrophobic and that means runoff and potential uh, flash flooding. It's something that we have seen in Western parts of North America. As for this current drought, long range forecast models continue to bring hot and dry weather to much of the northern latitudes, perhaps pointing back to a heat wave in the northern Pacific. La Nina is expected to kick in for the winter, which usually means colder and wetter for most, most of the northern latitudes. And now you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet, I'll try to get it answered. Johanna, thank you so much. You are watching Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, it is the oldest and most prestigious magic organization in the world, and past presidents include the great Harry Houdini himself. Well, now the Society of American Magicians' newest president is a Vancouverite. The most illustrious Rod Chow is here with us today. Rod, hello and welcome. Thank you, Gloria. Nice to see you. Tell me about this organization and how, how it feels to be stepping into the, into the shoes of Harry Houdini. It's really great. Um, it, this organization, I've actually been involved with it in, for many decades, mm -hmm. uh, but I've actually I've gone up the ranks and uh, become uh, a, a regional vice president and then into national council. And finally, now it's the most uh, illustrious position because they do actually address me as most illustrious, the national president and the first ever Canadian of this organization, which is a worldwide organization. Most illustrious. Yes. It does have a certain cachet, doesn't it? it does. So, so what do you do? Get together with with other magicians and, and share your secrets? That's exactly what we do. But we do that and more. So we actually have shows. Uh, we actually have uh, lectures. We actually um, have a whole resource of uh, things that other magicians can actually uh, access. Okay. So, yeah. I mean, but would you would you actually show each other? This is how I do it, or this is the sleight of hand. Do, do you give away your secrets? See, I guess this is the only time you're allowed to actually share secrets when you're amongst magicians that actually have sworn to the code, uh, and and are not you're not there sh uh, exposing secrets. You're there to actually help them learn magic. So and that's okay. Uh, what is not uh, not not allowed is exposing secrets. So we're not allowed to share secrets with other people for the for the sake of just. Uh, letting them know how the trick is done. I see. And yeah. how would you describe magic in the, in the modern age, I guess, especially when you consider the use of, of technology in, in the picture today? Well, actually, magic has evolved. Okay, so it was from the olden days, it was like the Volvo days, big theater, uh, big illusions, and, and many people involved in the show. These days, you can actually watch it right on your computer screen, right, if you wanted to. But there's nothing like a live performance, so no matter what, uh, uh, you know, what the technology you have out there, if you're actually doing magic face-to-face -face in a person's own palms of their hands and even inside their mind, that's incredible magic. Well, it sure is. Yeah. Well, when, did, when did you start? Your, your magic um, meanderings. <laughs> actually, I started when I was a kid. So my parents actually got me into it. Uh, their favorite uh, destination vacations was uh, Reno and Las Vegas, which of course is the magic capitals of the world, right? Sure. And they were well known by the casino hosts. So every time they went in the casino and they did a little bit of gambling, when they left the casino, they actually got 
decks of cards. Not even just a few decks, like boxes of cards. And soon enough, I actually amassed a collection of like almost a thousand cards, right? Decks of cards, was something incredible. So what do you do with cards? Well, you can play cards, but I thought, well, why, why don't I do magic with them? Wow, so that's yeah. where it all, very organically it yeah. all started. Okay, you had this amazing card collection and you mentioned your parents. And we, we have to acknowledge the, the passing of your, your father, Jack yes. Chow. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, I know he was a, a major influence here in Vancouver, but let, let's talk about the, that narrow building that, that was very much and still is, is in your family. It is, yeah. He actually had the foresight to actually acquire this building uh, back in, in the 80s. In right? Chinatown? In Chinatown. It's, it's, uh, it's actually right at the beginning of Chinatown. Uh, Carol and Pender, and when he got it, actually, it was actually quite dilapidated, and no one really cared about it, but he actually did this as a incendial project for Vancouver back in, in the day there, right? and he actually renovated the entire building and made it famous. He actually got it into the Guinness Book of Records. It wasn't in the Guinness Book up, up until that point as in time. skinniest office or skinniest building in the world? The skinniest building in the world, yes, absolutely. It's only four feet, 10 inches, so I can barely get in there, but uh, everything actually inside is full size, so we're kind of <laughs> working with full size things, but as long as you're, you know, about this, you're okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when you actually work in there on a daily basis? I do, I with do. With an insurance. This I do is insurance. Jack Chow Insurance. Jack Chow Insurance is our business. And in fact, um, my father had the foresight to install window wickets over the sidewalk. So this is a public sidewalk, and the building actually from the front <laughs> looks really wide. It's like a whole block wide, and there's a glass sidewalk along the entire frontage, right? But so we installed uh, these window wickets with stainless steel counters, because back in olden days, they actually served people out the window. So we thought we'd back, bring back a historical use but we have sell insurance, so we needed a place for people to lean over to write and sign their documents. So we installed these window wickets. And so great, because as soon as the pandemic hit, you know, we did not have to close a day. We had safe service throughout that pandemic. Right. Yeah. But you get people just coming by just wanting to look at the building, not necessarily to buy insurance. So you get a lot of people like looky-loos. Lots of people looking. Everyone actually wants to come in and actually feel how wide it is uh. themselves. Yeah. But they do actually extend their uh, arms across the end of the building and take pictures. That is amazing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. are we going to do a little bit of magic here today? Oh, absolutely. You, you Let me just show you something quick. Uh, actually, here, um, I have a business card. This is the Society of American Magicians card mm -hmm. that I got. It does say national president on it, but I'm, I'm going to let you use that uh, pen for just a moment. Okay. And I want you to actually, uh, first of all, choose a card. You can actually have you can any Choose money. any business yeah, yeah. card, any business yeah, card. Yeah, make sure you're happy with it because if you're yeah. not, I have 51 other choices. All right. <laughs> are you Society happy? of American Magicians. Right. Yes, okay. okay. Well, I want you to sign your name on the, on, the, on the back part, on the red part there. Okay. Excellent. And that personalize it to your name, uh, Gloria. Okay. Perfect. Okay, and we'll place it, make sure it's dry and good. We'll just place it back in. Perfect. We'll just place it back in the same way. Okay. That. Okay, now you know that the, the card right now is personalized, but it actually has to be activated. You know when you get a coffee card, right? Coffee card is actually no good until you actually activate the card. Okay. okay so we're going to actually activate this card, okay? And the way we do it is through this strip here. It's like a magic wand under the Society of American Magicians name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, but what it is, is a strip that picks up your body signature, which is your DNA. Okay, so all you okay. have to swipe it with your finger and it'll actually activate activate the card. Go ahead, swipe it. And it actually inputs your DNA into the card, <laughs> and activates it to your name. See that? <laughs> okay, so now that it's been active, we're gonna have Can to Can I actually, buy something uh, with it now? No, this, well, this is what you do. You actually insert it, like you insert a card in, into a bank machine. This is like, okay. you get the cash first. Okay, then you okay. buy something, okay? So we're gonna do that, and we're gonna actually test it to make sure it works. Okay, go ahead. Okay, swipe okay. That. that's gonna so put my that. energy in there as well. And yes, it works, so let's test it. Okay, one last thing, we have to do the two-step authentication process, okay? That's crazy. Yeah, I know, as we insert it here like this, I want you to slowly swipe it, okay? Slowly swipe it. As just, just at the front yeah, here? Go ahead, okay. slowly swipe it, and we go with that. Okay. And instant authentication. There you go, Gloria. So that's for that you. Is that is actually tested, authenticated, and working. So that's everything works on that now. You, you got me. You got me, Ron. This <laughs> is my email. <laughs> okay. That's amazing. Okay, I know how to I know how to contact you, but yes. I think you've left us wanting a little bit more. So I'm going to leave you to it uh, sure. with one more uh, okay. magic. Bit I'll of do magic my favorite then. How about that? Okay. Okay. Great to great to see nice you. To thank see you, you for coming right. in. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, I know a lot of us are going to be doing some traveling uh, because of you know now it's the time to travel. So. Uh, actually, I just got back from uh, the United States, and um, I have here uh, brought back a $20 U.S. bill. Now, of course, when you come back to Canada, come back to Canada, you actually have to convert that. So I like to do my own conversion and convert that into Canadian money. Canadian $20 bill. Now, since I'm doing my own exchange, I must have doubled that exchange rate. <laughs> That's a pretty good exchange rate, right? Now, I've also been to some other um, countries, and we go to other countries, you actually get quite a bit of foreign currency. So what I have here is money from Hong Kong. 
This is a Hong Kong 20 Hong Kong dollars. Here's 20 RMB from China. This is 10,000 from Bolivia, 1,000 from Brazil, and look at this, 100,000 all the way from Peru. Now, of course, we're in Canada, and we need to convert that into Canadian money. Canadian $20 bills. That's 20, 40, 60, 80, $100 Canadian. Now, I love $20 bills, but you know what? I actually prefer the higher denomination, like the 50, <laughs> or even better, my favorite, $100. I, these days, okay. on. Done. <laughs> I prefer to use credit. And there we go. That's for me. I can go traveling and unlimited credit. Thank you. Ron Chow, thank you. That was magical. My pleasure, Gloria. She's come undone. She didn't know what she was headed for. If you would like to go and see some live music, old time rock and rollers Randy Bachman and Burton Cummings reunite at the PE Rogers Amphitheater September 3rd. I'm picking up vibrations. She's giving me excitations. And the original Boys of Summer, the Beach Boys, also play the PE Amphitheater September 4th. Hi, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music, and earlier this month, tragedy struck the punk rock community in Canada when it was announced that Gord Lewis, a founding member of the iconic Hamilton rock and roll band Teenage Head, had been discovered dead in his apartment. Gord Lewis and his bandmates formed Teenage Head back in 1975, naming the, themselves after trivia fans a flaming groovies album title. Here's Teenage Head with their fabulous first single from 1978. Someday you remember me That is Teenage Head with their awesome mid-tempo rocker, their debut song, Picture My Face, which still holds up. Now, some 44 years later, music fans often think of Teenage Head as a kind of underground punk rock band, but the fact of the matter is they had an incredibly successful run of albums in the late 70s and early 80s. Their first three records went gold. Their second album, Frantic City, hit platinum status. That's Teenage Head with Let's Shake featuring the recently deceased Gord Lewis on guitar from the band's biggest album, Frantic City from 1980. Now, despite the record sales and the radio hits, notoriety followed Teenage Head in the form of Teenage Riots, one of them at the Horseshoe Tavern to end the famed last pogo performance in 1978, and another a few years later at Ontario Place which led that venue, now called the Budweiser Stage, to ban concerts for years. Riots marred the summer concert season in Toronto. It started in the early evening when late arriving fans for the Teenage Head concert found the Ontario Place gates closed. Apparently officials felt the forum was full and no more people should be admitted. Hundreds of additional police were alerted and at one point over 1,500 fans were involved in fights with police. Subsequently, despite the record sales and radio play, Teenage Head became a perennial bar band. 
packing clubs from coast to coast in Canada, but rarely leaving the country and rarely rising above that level. In 2008, Teenage Head's legendary frontman Frankie Venom died of throat cancer, and now, on August 8th, it was announced that founding guitarist Gord Lewis was found murdered, an alleged act of patricide. Gord Lewis was 65. Jonathan Lewis, believed to be Gord's son, has been charged with second-degree murder. If you want to learn more about Teenage Head, I strongly recommend the TV Ontario documentary on the band that was released a few years ago and is available on YouTube. Radio was playing our records. And that wasn't easy back then. You had Michael Jackson and Pink Floyd and Genesis and, oh, Teenage Head. Those are a few shots from Picture My Face, the story of Teenage Head, a great, if somewhat sad, documentary made even sadder still by the recent news of the passing of Gord Lewis. Picture My Face, the story of Teenage Head, is what you need to add to your watch list for this week. And from all of us in the Canadian music community, punk or otherwise, Thank you, Gord Lewis, for the tunes, the riffs, the albums, and for forging the way for the rest of us. I'm Grant Lawrence. Take care of yourself. Crank some Teenage Head, and I'll check in with you again soon. Hi, I'm Graham Witt, Parallel 49 Brewing, and you're watching Our Vancouver. Coming up, a local plant-based food enthusiast hopes to challenge your palate with her latest lox recipe. Welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Now, if you have spent any time on the coast, you will know wild salmon is served everywhere and in so many different ways. But now, a local foodie is sharing a recipe for plant-based lox. So just take a look at Happier Planet with Jamila Pomeroy. I've been plant-based the majority of my life, and I'm confident that I can convince a fisherman to enjoy a plant-based meal. Today we're going to make carrot lox. Now I used to absolutely love smoked salmon and when I first went plant-based it was probably one of the things that I missed the most. It's taken me years to find something that I think replicates those flavors, the smokiness, the you know aroma of the ocean and I think this does a good job. So I just cut the carrot in half and then take a standard vegetable peeler and you're just gonna go lengthwise on the carrot piece. So one of the really great things about making carrot locks is it's actually quite cost effective. You can make a bunch at once and use a whole bag of carrots, which is gonna, you know, not it's not gonna run you any more than $10. Of course, smoked salmon is a lot more expensive even just for a small amount. So what you're gonna to wanna to do is put all of the carrot pieces into your pot, um, cause you're gonna actually put the solution on top. So I wouldn't wanna fill it any more than this. We're gonna start with the brine. If you're using a standard mason jar, I would add a quarter of a cup of apple cider vinegar. Then I add about half a teaspoon of pepper, a little bit of salt, and then the super, super important ingredient is liquid smoke. The real star of the show is this Irish sea moss, and it is a moss that grows in the ocean, hence that great oceany flavor that it's bringing to this dish. Cook with this, it actually kind of starts to gel the solution a little bit, and you get sort of the glossiness you would see on smoked salmon. It's super nutritious. There's a load of really great things in it, like omegas, so you're getting a lot of the same things that you would find in salmon, but from moss, which is super cool. Cover the mixture with water and then place on the stove at medium heat. 
Once the carrots have reached an al dente texture, I take them off the heat and let them cool in the saucepan for a little while. Once they've reached room temperature, I put them into a mason jar and into the fridge for a few hours. So to put this recipe to the test, I am bringing Walter, who's a fisherman, in to taste this carrot lox. He is my father-in-law, loves fishing, loves seafood, so this is truly the ultimate test. So Walter, I know you've been fishing for a very long time and yes. you love fishing. Yep. How long do you think you've been fishing for? Oh boy, uh, 35 years or so. Wow, that's, yeah. that's awesome. Off and on, yeah. And I know you have like a very good taste for seafood. And yes, I do. I, yes. <laughs> so today I made a plant-based version of smoked salmon. So it's a carrot lox. It is cooked in a similar way that you would cook salmon, but obviously it's made out of carrots, not salmon. And I think it's a nice option that could be served with sure, smoked yeah, salmon. Sure. It has the same flavors. Um, you have a little bit of the citrus notes, there's dill, and yeah. a little bit of hickory smoke as well. Okay. When you look at it, it looks almost real in a sense because the color's a little off and there's right. very no, there's no grain. Exactly. But in a sense, when you look at it, it's almost the same way that I do mine, similar, but I just change things up a little bit. But yeah, I'll try a piece of that. Okay. The moment of truth. Here we go. <laughs> It's got a fair amount of citrus. I don't know what type of cheese did you put on there? It's a vegan cream cheese. It's a vegan cream cheese. Okay. Yeah. That's good. Yeah. I would, uh, it's not too bad compared <laughs> to a real McCoy. Yeah. I'd say, you know, it's about as close as you're going to get, I would imagine. That's amazing. That's yeah. amazing. Yeah. Well, I don't think that Walter is going to be switching carrot locks for salmon, but I do think that it will be something that he eats sometime in the future. A global shift to a plant-based diet could reduce greenhouse gases caused by food production up to 70% by 2050. Eating plant-based is a great way to lower your environmental footprint, and it doesn't mean that you have to give up the flavors that you love. Coming up, a rising Vancouver music star shines in a new Disney Marvel series. Hi, welcome back to Our Vancouver. I'm Gloria Makarenko. Well, his song is being used in a Marvel series. He's winning major awards for his music videos. And Jody Martinson spoke with music producer and DJ Acid Khan, better known as Convict, on the CBC afternoon radio show On the Coast. <laughs> And I mentioned your music has been used in the, the show Ms. Marvel. How did that happen? Yeah, it's crazy. Um, there's like so much synergy around that. Um, but the writer of the, and the co-producer of the show, her name is Sana Amanet. She's uh, like me. She's also from Pakistani heritage. She discovered my music through a friend of mine whose wedding I DJed back in 2015. <laughs> like he was just like sharing my stuff on his Instagram and she saw it and she was working on the show at the time. And so she really loved the music and just sent me an email. I had coffee with her in LA and all of a sudden two of my songs were in that Marvel show. That was, wow. that's how that happened. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think there's a whole bunch of um, parallels that are very accurate to my own life. I was 13 when I moved to Canada, also from Pakistan. Um, and so much of like seeing her journey through high school and stuff reminded me of my own and trying to find my own footing here. And then what's really cool is I think being somebody who grew up Muslim and came to North America post um, September 11, like September 23rd, 2001 was my first day of high school. Um, so I think from that angle, to see my culture represented in a positive light in mainstream media was like really refreshing. You know, it was like, oh, right, this is actually what mom and dad would be saying at home. Not every person with the name Asad is shown as terrorist in every other mainstream shows. So I think that was like a really big win for, for us as a community. It was nice to see that. So I actually grew up in Richmond. Oh, when in I first Richmond. moved here, I went to high school in Richmond. I went to Canby. Um, 
it was just, you know, it's really foreign. Like I grew up in a very different world for the first 13 years of my life. And it's, you know, it's a 13 year old boy. It's such a, you're going through so much change physically, emotionally. Um, that it was just like the whole thing is just upside down all of a sudden and you're in this new city. But I think all of that, like whenever I look back, it's just every single one of those things just confirms that all of that has to happen for what's happening now and so forth. So it all played a, it's, its part, you know. I'll try to do it justice. Um, this actually happened at the awards. I went up first and I like said thank you and what I had thought about the video. And then the director Anjali went up and she spoke so much more eloquently than I did. I was like, why did I speak at all? <laughs> it's her story and she's done a really beautiful job at, at showing it. But it's actually the story of the lead um, actress in the, in the actual music video, Seema, who plays the lead role. A lot of that is her life story. Like she has been antagonized her whole life for having dark skin growing up in India. And even after having moved here, like she still runs into discrimination for her skin color. And so the the gist of the story is about her journey through that and then fighting out of that oppression. And there is metaphor with Kali, the goddess of destruction, but really it's the goddess of recreation and new birthing of shedding of the old and birthing of the new. So it's kind of like Seema's journey of going through that, of the oppressive behaviors all around her, to eventually then finding her own strength and saying, no, that's the scene where she, you know, runs out of the, the temple looking place and like drops her clothes and starts to dance and express. So it really is her honest life story. And I think that's why people connected because like when she looks like she's sad, she's actually connecting with what's happened in her life. When I first started making music, I came from a DJ background, so it was very beat heavy and rhythm heavy because it was like, will this make people move? Will this make people dance? Whereas now I'm studying Indian classical music and that's taken me down this whole exploration of like, um, you know, like microtones and like what happens between two notes. And that is going to, I think, completely change the way I write my music when I bring that into sort of the electronic world. But in the beginning, a lot of the songs that are coming out now was just me trying to reach into my roots and connect with like closer is a sample that you know my mom's at age women in Pakistan would sing in a village just for a celebration or a wedding or something and that sample pack was in some Indian sample pack I downloaded and I heard it and I was like oh I recognize this from like when I was mm -hmm. a kid but then that is a part of who I am and what I've grown to love but then the part of me that is Canadian and grew up in the west coast loves going to Shambhala and loves <laughs> waste you know loves bass music and so I think the marriage of the two is kind of how my music started to happen. And as I find a more authentic, deeper connection with both of those, I think the music evolves according to that. I mean, I love Vancouver and where I live. Uh, my At the moment, my number one priority is my pursuit of the classical music that I'm learning. And my Guruji and my teacher, he's in White Rock. So as, you know, for a little while, I think I'd like to be there to do that. But after that, I, I actually, one of the things I love about music is that I think it's going to let me see the world. And so I, I really don't care to pick a spot right now where I say this is home for the next X amount of years. If by next year I have an opportunity to go live somewhere for four months and make music, I'd love to do that. When we bring you stories here at CBC Vancouver, we have award-winning photographers out capturing the images that say so much. You know, still images, they add context and they can bring a different perspective to the understanding of an event or an issue. So here are some of the latest images from what happened this past week. That's all for our Vancouver for this week. I hope you can join me weekday afternoons on CBC Radio 1 for On the Coast. For now, goodbye. <laughs>